Welcome to episode 225 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Joaquin Jack Garcia, who served in the FBI for 26 years. During his career, he was assigned to the Newark, San Juan, Philadelphia, and New York divisions. However, for 24 of his 26 years of service, he traveled all around the country successfully working undercover in over 100 FBI operations. In this episode, Jack Garcia reviews several of his early undercover roles and, of course, his final role, infiltrating the New York mob as Jack Falcone. During this undercover role, Jack played a self-described Sicilian jewel thief and drug dealer from Miami. While working undercover in New York, he gained the trust of mobster Greg De Palma, and was able to penetrate the Gambino crime family for nearly three years. That case resulted in the arrest and conviction of 35 mobsters. Jack played his undercover role so convincingly that he was proposed for membership into the mob. Jack is a guest speaker and lecturer at the FBI Academy and the FBI National Academy and the FBI Citizens Academy, on undercover agent training and sensitive operations. He has appeared on 60 Minutes, the Investigative Discovery Channel, CBS Evening News, CBS Early Show, and Good Day New York on Fox. Jack also serves as the Volunteer Director of Investigations for Guardians of Rescue, an animal rights and welfare organization whose members work to protect the well-being of all animals and their owners, and come to the aid of those in distress. Jack is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Making Jack Falcone, an undercover FBI agent takes down a mafia family. His story has been optioned by Paramount Studios for a feature film. One thing I forgot to ask Jack about during the interview was whether or not he and his wife still go out dancing. Jack was a guest at my wedding and reception, and believe me, he and his wife took over the dance floor. I'm serious. You don't even know. That man can hustle. Jack mentioned several names of retired agents during his case review. My plan is to invite many of those on the show to talk about the case from the case agent point of view. I'm always looking for fascinating cases for the show. Before we get to the interview, I want to let you know that retired agent Ray Carr's book on his Carl Gugazian case is finally out. I know a number of you have been waiting for it for, well, (laughs) several years now. I interviewed Ray on episode two more than five years ago. The episode was Ray Carr tracking Carl Gugazian, the FBI's most prolific bank robber. What I'll do is put a link to that episode and your podcast app's description of this episode. That link will take you back to the original show notes where you'll find a link to where you can purchase Ray's book, 30 Years on the Run, The Hunt for the Most Prolific Bank Robber in History. I have added Ray's book and Jack's book to my FBI reading resource which is a colorful list of books about the FBI written by agents who have been guests on my podcast. You get access to the list of more than 60 books when you join my reader team. Speaking of my reader team, I just sent out my monthly email for March. I review the documentary MLK FBI. It's a period in the FBI's history that I wanted to learn more about and, well, come to terms with. So if you're listening to this episode, the week it comes out, check your inbox. If the email's not there, well, you know what to do. Check your spam filter and your promotion tab. 
I want to welcome all new listeners and invite you to join my reader team, where once a month, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV and movies. There's a link to join my reader team in your podcast apps description of this episode, along with a link to where you can purchase my books. Thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Joaquin Jack Garcia. Hey, Jack, how are you? Hey, Jerry, doing great. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, the first thing that I'm going to say to you is, I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> Mea culpa, I am sorry. You're right. <laughs> and and you've explained to me, you know, why, you know, it took so long for you to get on the, on the show. And you know what? I don't care. As long as you're here and that I get to talk to you and we get to catch up with each other. That's all I care about. So thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for having me, Jerry. And you and I do go back a long time, back to the uh, mid 80s. And uh, I'm very happy for your success on this uh, great podcast. And what a fabulous platform for uh, the men and women in the FBI to tell their stories about the great cases. So I'm honored you asked me and I do apologize for not coming on earlier. I remember the first time that we met. Do you remember? Yeah, I think it was Squad 11. Uh, No, no, it wasn't. Oh, fill me in. It was at the FBI Academy. Now, I think I was back at the Academy for an in-service, and you had learned that I was being transferred from Sacramento to Philadelphia. You came up to me in the cafeteria, and you sat down, and we talked for about 20 minutes, and I thought to myself, my goodness, this is the nicest guy in the world. It just really kind of filled me in on, you know, what the Philadelphia office was like and the people and got me really excited about being transferred. So that was the first time that we met. You're right. It just came back to me. Wow. Yeah. And then, of course, we ended up becoming close friends at a time that I would say for both of us was a low point in our careers. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so uh, (laughs) I had um, anchored one of the supervisors who I had no idea had gone to high school with one of the ASACs, and I was suddenly removed from my nice assignment and sent to the applicant squad. And in your book, you've been very open and frank about you know, your issues with a particular supervisor because of your weight. And so, you know, we were both at this low point of our careers where our contributions were not being valued. And all I have to say to those people is, yeah, how do you like us now? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, it's true. Yeah. I mean, listen, that's what, that's why I guess 26 years in the Bureau, we have uh, great stories. There are high points, low points. And uh, what kept us alive is we kept going. No matter what adversity we fell into, no matter what happened, what little petty issues people might have had. Hey, you know, I know a lot of people didn't like me, but that's okay because I didn't like them. So it kind of flows. But you know what? We move on. We keep going. And I'm kind of fortunate the way things turned out at the end for the both of us. Yeah, I think we had successful careers. You <laughs> you, you took it to a whole different level. But I, I, I think at the end, we both still, you know, love the FBI and still Absolutely. are happy that, as you said, despite the, the low points of uh, and high points, the ups and downs of our career are glad that, you know, we were members of the, well, are still members of the FBI family. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Looking back, I'm so grateful. It was such a great career. I still go out and talk about it to uh, kids in school. I try to recruit. I tell people all the time that this is such an amazing career and it's the greatest law enforcement agency in the world. And we were part of it. And it's really, it's uh, very humbling and, and it's an amazing honor to have. Yes. All right. So what I thought we would do is, of course, the culmination of your career was when you got to hang out with Greg De Palma, who was a made member of the Gambino family. And of course, I mean, the ultimate was your your time on 60 Minutes, which I watched with such pride. You know, I know him. I, I know that guy. But I thought what we would do before we get into that undercover role. 
is to talk about all of, or as many as we can, of the undercover roles where you learned the craft, where you actually did on the street training that enabled you to be able to pull off that big mob infiltration. So what was your very first undercover role? Well, that's a great question, Jerry. They were looking for a top 10. Where were you at the time? You were in I Newark. I was in Newark, Newark, New Jersey, which is my first office. And the agents were pursuing this top 10, and they wanted a guy to go into one of these houses of ill repute to look for a specific woman who was favored by this top 10. So they sent me in and, you know, negotiated. We found out where that woman was. And then I wound up going to Puerto Rico on a special with the FALN terrorist group, and they captured the top 10 in a shootout in New York City. So my first undercover experience was going into this house of ill repute and looking for this. And I was kind of saying, wow, this is cool. It got your adrenaline pumping, you know, your whole idea of, you know, going on the cover. And then I got into it as we went along. And then I was asked to go work this uh, narco national security case. And that's what I did. So it was all trial and error. And as I started that investigation, I had to go to the FBI's UC certification. What had happened was William Webster, who was the director, was on Capitol Hill and said that all their undercover agents received training. Well, that was incorrect at the time because this was as a result of AFSCAN. This was as a result of Greystoke out of Chicago. I think you had that particular agent on your show. So what happened was they brought in all these agents in who were out in the field. And, you know, we all look really weird. I mean, you know how Quantico was back in the 80s. Then I had long hair, guys had big afros, and they wound up taking us out of there the first day and put us, locked us away in some place where we couldn't be seen. And that was the second undercover training school. The first was the one that the guys from Abscan, to Stone, and all those guys went to. We were the seconds as a result of it. So now I got into it, and I was bit by the bug. It was, uh, to me, it was an adrenaline high, you know, working on the cover. The fact that you're across someone, and someone believes who you are posing to be, it was a rush for me. It was something that I really liked. You know, as an undercover, you have to be an actor and a salesman. You know, of course, you're acting some role that they've created for you to do, and you're selling them who they think you are. So you're a salesman and selling them your new identity. So that, to me, was something that that I liked. It excited me, something that I really felt comfortable in doing. Do you think that you have to have that adrenaline, you have to have that rush in order to be a good undercover person? Is it something that is a kind of physical thing that you feel that makes you good at what you do? Well, that and other things. One thing about undercover work, this is not something you could teach. You could send someone to the evidence response team and teach them how to collect and gather evidence. You could teach someone in the SWAT team to go out there and how to do entries and work as an operator. But to be an undercover, this, this you can't teach. You have to have that type of persona. You have to be a person who is outgoing. You have to be comfortable being around people that you don't like or are even no way like you. You got to be confident, but that confidence has to be realistic. You know, I, I, based on your training and life experience, it can't be wishful thinking. You have to know what a reasonable risk is and what it's not. You have to be like a chameleon, a quick thinker, a bullshit artist. If you don't have those traits, Quantico can't teach you those traits. Those are personality traits that were formed early on in your life. You can't learn this. So what I always looked at and when I taught some of the undercover classes is fine-tune these situations, these skills that people have in order to become an undercover. If you don't have those skills, you're not going to learn them. You can't. Okay, so if somebody thinks they want to be an undercover and they go to the training class, And as an instructor, you know, you kind of look at them and say, they're not going to make it. What happens then? I mean, is it just a matter of, sorry, dude? Yeah, Um, that's that's about it. Because if not, they get hurt or they're going to hurt others. 
I know when I was there on several occasions, they brought in people from all over the country just to see how we did things. And it was really a testament to the FBI, the way we ran and undercover through the many scenarios that you put the agents through and you certify them to become undercover agents. But the problem sometimes with that certification, Jerry, is that you can't do, like a guy like me, I've done a lot of undercover in my bureau days, but there are jobs that I know I cannot do and I will not do because even though I'm certified, it doesn't matter. There are jobs, I'll give you an example, pedophilia. I can never work those type of cases. You know, as important as that is, kudos to the agents that could work the innocent images thing. Becoming a white collar crime investigator or undercover like you, I can't. I don't know Series 7, Series uh, 3, Series 63s, all of those stuff. I don't know. I can't pose that. I'm more comfortable with the other type of element, your drug trafficking element, your bank robbery, your corrupt police, councilmen, all of those cases that I worked in my career, I felt comfortable. And I think I did well because I felt comfortable. I wasn't, it wasn't a stretch for me to say, well, I'm going to be, just because I'm certified, I'm going to work innocent images. I I couldn't do that. I, I just, in a million, I couldn't work bikers. I worked around biker on one case. That's not me. That's, that's just not your personality. And you shouldn't assume roles that you can't do because you're going to mess up. You have to do roles that you're comfortable in. And that's what I learned early on. Good. And let's talk about that a little bit because it's almost like an audition for both the undercover agent and the case agent, wouldn't you say? You get together and meet and talk about what the undercover scenario is and decide if you're the right fit and they decide if they think you're the right fit. Yes. And that's very important because I went through all of those. And, and, and Jerry, you nailed it there. I've been in interviews with agents who have been case agents who I knew from the get go, there's no way I could deal with this person. Okay. We just, we clash. I've gone to situations where they probably said, I can't deal with this guy, okay? And I always added a different element. I want to meet the source who's going to introduce me. I want to know what that source's opinion of that source, rather, in the street is. If that source is a jerk-off, guess what? I'm a jerk-off. If that source is respected, respected. So I needed to find out from the source who's going to be making the introduction, what their standing is, because I would then assume that a person of high stature is not going to hang out with an idiot. A person who is an idiot is not going to all of a sudden show up with some guy and vouch for him and say, hey, this guy is good. Well, who are you? You're a nobody. You're going to vouch for this guy. So all of these things fall into play. Yes, I've actually had case agents that contacted me to work on the cover and they whipped out a script, a script, and I would entertain it and read them and say, hey, dude, what's happening? Hey, dude, what the hell is that? No one talks like that out there in the world, but they wanted that control of having you just give me the parameters as an undercover, what you need to establish. Give me the violation. What I want to know what the case is about, and then I'll let you know if I could do it or not. If I can't do it, then God bless, you know, make my opinions known and say, look, I think this is what you need to do because the way you're going at it may not be the right way or just let it go on their own. But I learned to experience and it's all it is is trial and error. Plus, the most important part that I feel an undercover needs to do is talk to the assistant United States attorney. Cases that I had, even when I was in Philly, as you know, Jerry, I worked a case with Van Marsh and Jerry Peters. It was a very big case, money laundering case. And when we went to trial, we wound up arresting like 80 some odd individuals and we made over 40 drug buys. These are kilo plus drug buys in just this one case. But when we sat down with the AUSAs and replayed the recordings, we would be looking for the unintelligibles. We were looking for the voice attributions. We would take a look to to make sure that it was everything needed to have been said in that tape could go to court and stand as hardcore evidence and convict the individual. And that's the important part because you need to know the elements of the violations that you're going to be doing. So we spent a lot of my learning, I think, was reviewing 
the post on the cover work. And Jerry and I used to sit with the assistant AUSA Dave Fritchie, who is great. He was very fastidious. Yeah, I did a I did a case with Dave, so yeah. So you know what kind of person he is. Yeah, he's, he's very guy. fastidious guy, and he would make you go over and over and over. But you know what? You learn. And what I also learned from then was that if you go out, and I always believe in wearing a recorder. I always felt that if you wear a recorder, it's kind of indefensible to use their words, you know. It's no longer the days of an FBI agent testifying in court and say, well, I'm a special agent of the FBI or I'm a New York City detective. Nowadays, you're attacked. So you want to capture the conversation where the person says, I committed the crime, I'm about to commit the crime, or I committed the crime. So you want that. That was always the thing. So I chose to wear a recorder pretty much all my meetings. And it was something that if it didn't come out or something was unintelligible, I would make it a point after I got back to the office, I would listen to the tape. I would go back the next day or the next week and relive that moment because I wanted it on tape. I don't want it where if it's not on tape, you're going to get really attacked in that courtroom. And so, yes, I wore a recorder. Now, people say, well, do you ever get patted down? Fortunately, I was never patted down. But think about it. If somebody pats you down, when you start to wonder whether you can trust someone or not, that is when you already know that you don't. So even though they may pat you down and find nothing, do you think that distrust is going to go away, Jerry? Ah, That's a great point. It doesn't go away. The person still did that for a reason. So they didn't trust you. They Mm -hmm. didn't trust you. And even though they found nothing on you, they still didn't trust you. So I, I, it's, it's a delicate dance that you do when you're working on the cover, but it's always a learning experience. The key thing is when I, I, most of my experience was working dope because that's, I did that in Philly. I did that, of course, in New York and wearing New York, it kind of became easy. I knew what the violations were. I, I went with it. I understood what was going on. I had tremendous backup team. I mean, that's the beauty of the FBI. You know, we don't go out there half cocked and, and crazy. I mean, you have tactical planning. You, you have your people that are looking out for your interests. We call them ghosts that are out there watching you, making sure that you come home safe at night at the end of this operation. And what role did you play in this case that you were working with Van Marsh and, and Jerry Peters? I was the, well, that was an interesting case because not only Van Marsh, Jerry Peters and I, we handled the source, we worked case agents, and we were the undercover, which in hindsight, that should never have been. I mean, Jerry could attest to it. Jerry and I, we would talk with this source who was very volatile. This guy had a drinking problem. This guy was a guy who drove around in a Rolls Royce. He had diamond watches, diamond rings. He would have a this huge metal that contained rubies and diamonds. And he was a bookie. And whenever he felt short, he would pop either a ruby, an emerald, a diamond. He would pop that from this thing. He was the guy that was feared. And tr- And I'm talking about North Philadelphia. I'm talking about the Badlands. I'm talking about 7th and Orkney. So, yes, we worked those cases, and we also made the undercover buys. The case agent talked to the source and made the buys. And in hindsight, horrible way to operate a case. We had another case agent that handled the wiretaps only. And together, we wound up making a very big investigation. Like I said, over 80 or so individuals were arrested, and then all these other cases that were derived from it. Now, it was one of the first money laundering cases in the Bureau, because what we did, since Philadelphia is a consumer town, what we did is took their money that contained residue of cocaine, their fives, their tens, their twenties, and converted them into brand new $100 bills. Now, the reason for that is you could take a million dollars that is in twenties and it'd be like a duffel bag full. But we could do a million dollars, which we did, and be so compact with brand new spanking $100 bills. 
Now, the reason for that popularity was that now you're able to secrete that money. Now you're also keep it from being detected by smell by the dogs. But what it did for us in the FBI, because we're not in the business of facilitating drug trafficking, we identified who these drug traffickers were. We identified where they lived, and then we worked independent, probable cause, and worked to go after them. At the end, we seized a lot of that money. Plus, we seized uh, a lot of cocaine as well. We identified the cells from New York that were bringing in the dope. So it was one of the first money laundering cases. And it's in fairness, there was Van Marsh and, of course, the supervisor, Jim Fossum. And I came in later on. And then Jerry came in to replace Van. And we had an, an amazing case in Philly, which ended around 87 or 88. I'm sure you remember that case, Jerry. It was a very big case in Philly. Oh, that absolutely. Was done. And you played, and you played the role of the money launderer. Yes, we were money launderers. But we also, we came up with a, a great scenario. We said to the, the bad guys, I said, listen, we were trying, because you have to source the money and the drugs, okay? So we said, hey, look, I got a guy that is interested in buying some of your product. Why don't you sell me one of your kilos and I'll sell it to him so he could taste your merchandise. And if he likes it, we'll put you guys together but you got to start giving us more money to launder and or connect us with your Colombian people. Well, yes, they went and did that, but they weren't coming through their end. So we just, it didn't matter to us. Now we laundered money from them. We have a Coke buy from them, a kilo buy, and then we went on moved to somebody else. So it was uh, probably one of the better cases that I worked in my career. And it was uh, really amazing how much work. This is uh, one of these cases that consumed you. I mean, you can have Jerry Peters will tell you, this was a 24-7, 365. It was a case where there was always something going on, whether the informant was out there, God knows what. And it was then it became like a project for the squad. And everybody chipped in, and the, the success was uh, fantastic on that. And why did you? I don't remember why you left Philly for New York. Was that because you didn't want your cover blown? They already knew who you were in Philadelphia. No, what had happened was I wanted to go home. You know, New York City's my home. I grew up in uh, Washington Heights in the Bronx. I kind of wanted to come back home, as did my wife. That was one. And number two. I was about going to get fired for my weight, not losing weight. So I figured, let me go to New York. And I left at the end of the investigation, just before the arrest. And Jerry like took over everything. And so I was helping Jerry before. Now Jerry's kind of on his own, but the case came down. But that was my reason. I wanted kind of just to go home in New York. New York is a whole different breed in the FBI. I mean, it's it's the flagship of the Bureau. I mean, you can make as big of a case that you want. And also in the drug world, all roads led to New York, you know? So I, I just wanted to go there and uh, leave Philly. And uh, I thought I left. It was a great time. Uh, the case was successful. And I moved on to New York. And I was very blessed to have gotten on probably one of the premier bureau squads. It was called C-13. We had, we had the NYPD assigned to the squad. Plus, we have 15 agents. Out of those 15, we have five who became SACs. One, an assistant director. We had also one of your previous guests, Jimmy Gagliano, was on our squad. And then, of course, we had what they call NYPD detectives. We had second and first graders. Now, for those who don't know, when you get a gold shield in the NYPD, you are a third grade detective. And then if you uh, do outstanding work, you move on to become a second grade. But the first is the most difficult. They get paid as much as a sometimes a captain or a lieutenant. So it's important for them. To, there are very few of them. And we had several of them. Now, we have this squad full of probably the greatest men and women in the FBI at the time. We let the Bureau in seizures, in money, seizures, drug seizures, and subjects. I mean, we were rocking and rolling. We had four undercover cases, two wiretaps at one time going. And it was just, to me, it was just home. I, I loved it. It was total energy. I was doing the undercover and just about all of them. And 
it was, uh, it, it, you couldn't find a better group of men and women that worked together in the FBI. And that became my home. And that's where I ultimately even retired from. So I'm very grateful to have learned from the NYPD undercovers, as well as the guys that I've met while I was working in New York. You've already spoken about your weight. And the reality is that what was initially considered a big problem in the Bureau, because, <laughs> you know, it's all about physical fitness and the way you look and, and, and all of that. But your weight is a big ingredient to what made you so successful. Yeah, it did. You know, look, I know that there are rules to go by, you know, and we all know that. And I have always had an issue with my weight, you know, and I get it, you know, and I've been censured many times for my weight in my career. I do try to make an effort. I do always feel that, hey, it is bad for you and your health. I get, I get all that, but I'm one of those guys that eats from stress. And, you know, we went through a lot of stress when you work a case. Yeah. Okay. Maybe some guys go drinking. Maybe some guys have their marriage break apart. Maybe some guys have other issues. I chose uh, a box of Entimates. Okay. So it, it, it's kind of my thing. It was what I did. I gained it. Yes. Did it help? Yeah, it, it did. I will say, but it also was like a double edged sword. An example would be is God forbid I'm placed in a, in a, I'm going to get killed situation. I may say to the guy, I said, listen, hey, before you whack me, just know I'm an undercover FBI agent. Now, two things are going to happen. Either the guy is going to laugh and kill me, or if he does go around, what is he going to do? Call up the FBI and say, hey, you have an agent who is 6'4", 320. Anyway, they're going to say, that's not going to happen. So yes, I used it to my advantage, but also when I got later on and I started working mob cases, I felt that, hey, what if they don't want to believe I'm an agent, but they want to believe I'm a rat? Now, the penalty for that is two different things. So I did use my weight. The fact that I had long hair, the beard, the earrings, all of that, that goes with doing undercover work when it comes to narcotics. But it was also something that I just failed to do. I, I just, I tried losing weight. It didn't happen. Hey, you know, it is what it is, but it was something that I remember times when Jerry and I were out there working in the Badlands, buying dope and being around these people that were basically killers. And I'm getting paid to go back to the office to get weighed. I mean, really? Really? <laughs> you know? So, so I, I mean, you know, but hey, listen, we can't harp on those things that just the way it is. And I'm sure a lot of people have issues. We had some guys in our office in, in uh, Philadelphia who actually were beached without pay just because they violated the Bureau's weight standards. You know, it is what it is. And fortunately for me, when I went to New York, you know what? God bless New York. Everybody is out there working. It's a great city. It's the flagship of the Bureau. People are more concerned about where they're going to park their car. I got to drive two hours because I can't afford the real estate than they do about how much you weigh. And even more so, whether or not you're producing, whether or not you're bringing in any stats, I think that probably is the bottom line when it comes to the FBI. I know that, you know, that's when, you know, my career took off when I was, you know, making the arrest and doing the searches and, and, uh, and all of that. And I guess that's the same with you. When you started really producing and making cases, then how much you weighed wasn't that big of a deal anymore. Yeah. And you're right about that. It's all about production. I mean, look, I could have been a slug, sat around, did nothing all day long, but I didn't. I mean, we were you, in- You would have been You would have been fired, definitely, at that point, because there's no reason for anybody to want to go to bat for you, to save you. Yeah, you know? but I listen, there was a lot of issues that came down my way. When I transferred to New York, here I am, a Spanish-speaking agent with a lot of experience working narcotics. My squad of transfer was the, what did they call that? The plaster police. They were rebuilding the New York office, and they were assigning me to this squad. And I contacted them. I said, what are you talking about? I've been working narcotics. I'm going to go to the plaster police. Really? So I knew that was an inside job. You know, but that's fine. But then fortunately for me, I never reported because Dave Fritchie, 
the assistant needed me and Jerry to review all the transcript. So after my TDY in Philadelphia and the many court cases that we went through, I think I was four or five of them cases, then I accepted, okay, well, I guess I'm going to the plaster police squad. But it turned out that my hooks were bigger than their hooks. And my hook got a call from Charles Dombro, who to this day I respect. He was the ASEC at the time. And he called me up and says, I don't believe what they're saying in Philly. So you're going to go to work on C-13, which was that drug squad. And I'm forever grateful for Charles Dombro for getting me off with this vendetta hit to go to the plaster police. And I went on C-13, met, like I said, the greatest men and women, the FBI guys that I learned so much and I was to this day very close with. And we didn't bother about weight. We didn't deal with nonsense, with little petty stuff. We were there for the business at hand. And that's putting the bad guy in jail. Excellent. And just to clear that up for people who haven't read the book, what you're talking about, about a vendetta, is that there was one particular supervisor. And no matter how much you were producing, no matter how hard you were working, all he cared about was the weight. Yeah, that's that's about it. Well, it's it's funny because what it, my weight, the weight that I was being going to be fired for in Philadelphia for violating the bureau standard because I'm 6'4". At that time, I was like 320. I mean, I would kill for that weight today. I would have killed for that weight when I was in New York. New York, I got up to about 390. But I never got into any issues. Yes, you got your physical. The, yes, the nurse said you got to lose weight. But not, let's go after this guy. I, I mean, you know, it's like, you know what? These are things that I don't bog myself down with it of this administrative minutia stuff. But like you said too, Jerry, is if you're out there producing, if you're out there working, if you're putting your life in harm's way, okay, what are we doing here? You're going to go after a guy for his weight? Yeah, I'm sure the guys who are in great shape Work out would say, oh, this guy here, he should have lost his violation of the Bureau. I know all about the violation of the Bureau standards. I'm well aware of that. I got censure letters to show you about that. Okay, but it is what it is. It happened, but you know what? I didn't let that sink me. I didn't let that get to me. I continue with working and trying to do what I was supposed to do. And I look back with no regrets. I don't look back and say, well, you know, I should have lost the weight. No, that's not what I do. Uh, you know, other things I'm more worried about than that. Well, let's talk about some of the undercover roles that you worked initially in New York. And then I think everybody is going to be kind of anxious to hear about, you know, the Greg De Palma part, but just just a few more, if you could, of those early undercover roles that where you really learned and, and grew even more confident in your abilities as an undercover agent? Well, when I got to New York, like I said, working with the NYPD, you know, it's all about sources. And, you know, it's funny. I always tell people, especially those who are going into law enforcement, is there is no such thing as a great undercover agent. There's no such thing as a great detective or agent. We're as good as our sources are. OK, that's what makes this. The better your source, the better your case. OK, the more information you have in creating cases. And one of the things that we felt great was in New York. I mean, we were rocking and rolling with informants. We were doing constant buys and we always went up the ladder. That's what you're supposed to do. I go out there in the street. I buy half a key. Boom. Arrest this guy. Flip him. He's getting me another guy for two keys. Then I do a hand. Boom. I get four or five. And we would rock around the clock with this cases that we were working. Plus, then we worked the major investigations. We had guys like Charlie Cunningham, who was the SAC in, in Richmond. He had a case called WeaselCon. This case, he was working with a detective named Wen Banken. They had an informant that was unbelievable. The source, however, went bad, but she was a source that would provide them with all the locations for safe houses, for telephones where they did all that. And we took down millions and millions of dollars as well as dope from these guys. We had a, another case called Telewash that targeted the Mexican cartel of Amado Fuentes Carrillo. And we were also rocking around. I was doing uh, deliveries for these guys. Then we've moved on to a other case called Domingo Dollars that was with Dave Coletti and Kathy Mugan. These guys were uh, bringing in money, the Dominicans from the Washington Heights, returning it to the Colombian for all of the dope. We were laundering them, that money. 
So as you could see, this was not never ending things that were happening on that squad. We went in that squad at eight o'clock in the morning. We got home one or two in the morning. I mean, this was just wild the way we were working. And the way it works in New York is totally different than we're in the Bureau. Our primary is probably, my opinion, besides being a friend of mine, his name is Craig Arnold, who's probably the most decorated FBI agent in history. I mean, this guy is just amazing. We ran everything to him before it got to the supervisor. He would know, you know, fill us in what you need anything that you may want. And then he set up the tactical plans as to making sure that I would go home that night. And there were many close calls. There was one call where they had these gangbangers from Harlem. I was meeting and they were supposedly broken a deal with some Colombians. And next thing you know, other people show up with a total of nine people on the set. And then I'm out there talking to these guys. They want me to go to another location. I said, no, this is where My Santera, which is in Spanish for Santeria, told me we're going to do the deal. So the guy goes, well, look, I got to call my Santera and see if I can move from this location. So I go in, wind up calling, and I spoke to Michael Tabman or Craig Arnold and said, listen, the stuff here, they want me to go another location. I'm not going there because we don't know, A, where it is. It's not backed up like it is here. And they said, do not even move. We got three guys in the car. These guys look bad. We'll take this case down. They pulled the case down, locked up nine guys that were running down the streets of Queens Boulevard, New York with MP5s, locked up these guys. They all had in their trunk and in their car Tech Nines, Glocks. They had tape. They had rope. And they were going to do is they were going to tie me up and kill me. And they were going to tie up the Colombians and kill them and take their dope. That's what they were insisting that we go to the safe house. But you see, I learned from the experience not to chase the Kilo Ferry, not to go to this location just because you think everything is there. Listen, it doesn't work like dope. We've taken tons of dope off the street. The next day, there's still dope on the street. Okay. So I didn't go there because of the experience and also because I know how we in the FBI work. Like I said, Craig Arnold would make sure tactically what was protected. He was in a van. He jumps out. We locked up those guys. He was a SWAT team leader. I felt comfortable not taking risks because you're not supposed to take risks as an undercover, but more like I knew that I would be safe. And when you're working undercover and you know you are safe, hey, The world is your oyster, as they say, you know? Well, I know a lot of times people compare you, you know, the work that you did, which we still haven't gotten to yet, but we will, to Joe Pistone. And of course, the main difference is that Joe did not have that type of backup. You know, he was kind of out there. And I, I can definitely see where it is better for the Bureau, especially when you're talking about, you know, the change of the word of an FBI agent, you know, in your situation, you have all these people around you who can corroborate, you know, what happened and what you did. And in Joe's era, you know, it was Joe's word. And, you know, he would have to convince a jury in a trial that his word was the one that they could trust. With you, you've got all of this backup, not just for safety reasons, but also for the integrity of the case. Jerry, the time that that Joe's talking about, because I think Joe's case ended in 1981. Yes, it was when I started doing my undercover work early on, we didn't have backup. It was kind of, hey, go out there and, you know, do what you have to do. Call me in the morning, you know. Thank God the Bureau has changed from that, okay? Because one of the things that I always felt, even when we talk later about the the Greg De Palma case, I always had this guy out there. His name was Bim Lipscomb. He was always out there. And listen, even though I'm in talking to these wise guys in a place, he may not be there to protect me in case the proverbial should hit the fan. But he's outside. He knows I went in. He knows I never came out. And that's important. At least he knows where I'm at. And if we moved, I would call up like I was talking to my wife. I go, hey, baby, listen, I'm really tied up right now. Maybe another hour. I got to go somewhere up in the Bronx. Okay, boom. And it was him. 
So I believe that the way the Bureau has changed, because I've been in both. I did the on your own stuff. And now I've done the new way of doing it with the Bureau. And you know what? This is a hundred times better because I've always said that, listen, this is just the case. Okay. No matter how you break it down is the case. And if you don't make it today, that's why God invented tomorrow. You attack it tomorrow to try to do it, but you don't put your life at stake for a case. There is nothing. If you get to that level that you think the case, like maybe me going to that safe house to get the supposedly mother load, is going to stop the drug trade, it is not going to do that. But what's going to happen is maybe I'm going to get killed. There are people going to suffer, maybe the loved ones, maybe those who hate me will rejoice. But whatever the case may be is there is only a case. You know, you can't replace human life. You always should have backup. And if anybody out there does a lone cowboy and all that, you know, I'm not a believer of that. You know, it's it's been I've been on many close calls when things like that have happened. You always want. And by the way, the surveillance squads that are assigned in the bureau are like stealth. They're unbelievable. When they cover me in the in the Greg De Palma case, I would see pictures. I said, man, I didn't even see these guys. I mean, yes, there are times they get burnt. That happens all the time. But they know the system in place, how to go about changing that. But you should rely on that surveillance team at all times for your safety because your safety is paramount. The safety, and that's what I learned from Craig Arnold, was safety is the most paramount, safety and security. If you don't have that, don't bother doing the case because a case is not as important as the human life of a special agent of the FBI or any undercover detective or agent. I hear you. All right, so I think it's time for us to move on. And the ironic thing is that you were saying that your very first undercover role was that role where you were going into the massage parlor. And now this next big case that uh, you're known worldwide for starts off in a strip club. Yeah. Well, first of all, Jerry, isn't it funny? There's a theme. (laughs) There's a theme, yes. Maybe that's why I get picked. But you know, Jerry, something that's really interesting is how how romanticized and glamorizes the mob. I mean, working dope and of the other cases that I've done, I've worked Asian organized crime, Russian organized crime, police corruption, political corruption, murders for hires. This is what people want to hear. And it's glamorized, okay, because of Hollywood, that the mob is, we've we've taken down tons of kilos of cocaine that people would have died, children would have died, families destroyed, and it doesn't make the newspaper. You lock up one wise guy, is nonstop media coverage. It's insane the way the media, why is this happen? And, and that's where my situation was amazing. I never worked organized crime in my life. Now, I've done undercover cases with dirty cops posing as a wise guy, but I never worked traditional organized crime. And I had worked the Russian case with an agent named Nat Parisi. And he came along and he said to me, he said, myself and my cold case agent, Bill Reddy, came up with this idea that they had a source in place. I had a strip club that used to belong to the famous celebrity gangster named Greg De Palma. Now, who is Greg De Palma? Greg De Palma used to own a dinner theater in New York back in the late 70s. I actually went after graduating college there. That was a place that Frank Sinatra played. Dean Martin, Sammy Davis, Bette Midler, Diana Ross, Diana Carroll, Sonny and Cher. The who's who would perform at the Westchester Premier Theater, which was a place owned by the Gambino crime family and Greg De Palma. So Greg De Palma was a celebrity gangster. Then he winds up getting caught up in the scores, the famous strip joint that Howard Stern always talks about. And him and his son, who was also a gangster, get caught up along with John Gotti Jr. They wind up going to jail for shaking it down. Okay. He's in jail. Now comes this strip club in the Bronx. What happens is at one time that strip club was under the umbrella, okay, was on record with the Gambino crime family and Greg De Palma. So now the Albanians start showing up. Now, who are the Albanians? The Albanians were 
this uh, group of gangsters that wanted to become the sixth family of organized crime in New York. They had a love-hate relationship with traditional organized crime. Sometimes they worked for them. Sometimes they shook them down. Okay, but they were a very violent group that operated in New York. So they would go into this club demanding protection money. And they would go in and out and asking the guy for $5,000. If you don't, we're going to come back and destroy the place. Yeah, yeah. The guy told him, the owner says, look, I got bouncers. I got tough guys. Get out of here. You know, next week they come back again. This time they're getting a little more aggressive. Then finally, they go in, smack people around, break bottles, smack customers, throw the girls out and say, we will be back for $5,000. You hear me? So what happens the following day? This guy with lizard shoes, alligator shoes, he's wearing a pinky ring of diamonds. His name is Louis Filippelli, who is now a captain in Gambino crime family. And he walks in and he goes, hey, I heard you had a little problem. Well, we can make your problem go away. We'll keep those Albanians out, but you got to pay me $5,000 a month. So now you, you're catching on to the, the classic shakedown. You create a situation and then you offer a solution. So now the guy comes back to Nat Parisi and Bill Reddy and say, Hey, look, these guys are coming in the mob guys. What are we going to do here? So that's where I come in. I was brought in and I paid the 5,000 to the mob guy to keep the Albanians out. Now, the Albanians never came back. So what happened is we were starting to work this Louis Filippelli. We see him, by the way, he was unknown in the bureau. They did not know that who he was, but yet he was at that time a soldier in the Gambino crime family. So he was not in the famous charts or anything like that. They're following him. He's meeting, touching the right corners and everything. We're trying to make an effort going after him. And who comes out of jail? Greg De Palma. Greg De Palma comes out of jail because he claimed he was dying. He wasn't dying. I mean, the guy was in bad physical health, but hey, he still smoked about three packs of camels a day, you know, and he had lung cancer. Go figure this guy out, right? How old was he at the time? He was 71. Oh, okay. So, And so anyway, so he comes back in claiming his turf like, hey, this is my place. And, and all of that. Now, the FBI starts to get worried because Greg De Palma had a little issue when he was in prison. He tried to whack a soldier in the Gambino crime family that was on his crew for not going out there and picking up money and giving it to his wife. So while he's in prison, Greg De Palma takes a contract to whack this guy. And turns out that the guy who took the contract was an informant with ATF. So they arrest Greg De Palma while in prison, try him while in prison, and pleads not guilty, and he's acquitted. Okay? Now he comes out, and we're worried that Greg De Palma is going to get whacked. So the case agents went and talked to Greg De Palma and said, listen, you got a problem. We hear you're going to get whacked. So he says, don't let the door hit me on the way out. I don't know what you're talking about, right? So now we start looking, these guys put on the surveillance team on Greg De Palma. They see and he's touching the right bases. He's meeting with the forces. He's meeting with other captains. He looks like this guy is, you know, getting back into the flow, even though he did that. Yeah, resurrected. (laughs) Right. Now the original mobster who come and shook down the place that we paid 5,000 comes back and he says, hey, listen, Greg De Palma got his stripes back. That means he's a captain now. He got his stripes back because he was in trouble. Now, do you want to go with Greg or do you want to go with me? We chose Greg De Palma because Greg De Palma liked to talk and we liked to listen. So we kind of hitched our wagon, but we were very careful out there. The guys, the agents took care of me, making sure there was nobody going to come in and whack Greg De Palma and I'd be collateral damage. Because keep in mind, he still had a beef with Nicky LaSorsa, which was the guy that he tried to whack in court. So why didn't he get whacked? I mean, what was it that he that he did or said or had behind him that allowed him to do such a thing and then come out and not get whacked? Great question. 
The only thing we could come up with is that Greg De Palma was a big schmoozer. He was the kind of guy, like I said, a celebrity gangster who knew all these Hollywood guys when he had the club. And also, he played the game. See, in the mob, money flows upwards. It never flows down. So if you're on record or if you're a made guy in a family, whatever you make on a scam, you got to bring it, kick it up. Okay? Now, there's percentages. People say 10%, 15%. Correct the Palma would always give more because he was constantly proving his worth. So the more he gave, okay, of course, if I'm at the receiving end of that as the boss or the administration, I'm going to say, I like this guy because he's putting money in my pocket. So Greg De Palma, I think one of the reasons they tolerated all his little issues was because he was always giving money up. Okay, because if he was a brokester, if he had no money and he was not an earner, I guarantee you he'd be in the back of a trunk somewhere. But they didn't. So somehow he got in and Greg De Palma had a lot of construction guys up in the Bronx and Westchester that had big projects. And all of these projects generated money. And that money was generated to the administration or to the family. And also, they came to an accord, and I found out this later when I became Greg De Palma's driver, was that Greg De Palma and Nicky Lasorsa, the guy he took the contract, had to kiss and make up. They had to go back and quick the dissension and make it up for the sake of the family. That was from the top. So eventually, they did set up that meeting where they met and, you know, for whatever. But the meeting itself, it, I mean, the, the whole hit thing was all about money. The mob is all about money. There is no nothing else. It's all about making money in, in a legal way. And Greg De Palma knew how to touch the right buttons. And so he brought me along. And, you know, the one thing I have to say, working a case of this magnitude is the great work these case agents and also add to besides Bill Reddy and Nat Parisi and, and Chris Munger. And Bim Lipscomb, these guys really did a lot of work providing me with this stuff that I needed to make this case successful, you know? And, and that was what you really need when you're out there. You need a support team to have guys to make sure that if we did something, they can, or you said something that they wanted you to say that they would produce. I mean, for a while there, I was selling supposedly stolen televisions. And in reality, we would just go to the store, buy them and just, you know, give it to them or sell it to them at a discount price. So it showed them that I was an earner. I was a guy who was capable of making money because that's the attraction. This only reason people go to the mob is because they want protection or it's all about with them with money. If you're not making money for them, they have no, in, no interest whatsoever or want anything to do with you. Could you tell the story about when you first met De Palmer about the cigarettes? Because I thought that was so cool and <laughs> coincidental that, that you had something that he wanted. Well, I was working a case out of Atlantic City with Asian organized crime. And we part of it was smuggling in cigarettes for this Asian organized crime group. And you should talk to maybe talk to those case agents, you know, Nick Yanos and Mark and and Lou Calvary's. I was a secondary undercover on that. And and also rest in peace, Z-Man, who was another undercover, but unfortunately he passed on. But anyway, I we were working cigarette smuggling. So we set it up where one of the things is when you come out of jail with wise guys, everybody gives you an envelope. Okay. That's kind of to get your feet back on the ground. You know, like somebody had 3,000, another guy gives you 2,000. So I just met Greg and I didn't want to give him an envelope because uh, he don't know me from Adam. You know, well, that'll look even a little shakier. So somehow I'm talking to the guy who was his driver at the time and we're talking about cigarettes because this guy, what he would do is he would grub a cigarette and rip the filter off and smoke it straight up. And this is a guy, again, with about a quarter of a lung left in him, right? So we knew he liked the cigarettes. And I said to him, I, I, it was one of those things like, hey, you know, I can get you some counterfeit cigarettes if you got a guy to move it. So the guy lit up with that. 
So we said, okay, we dropped off these cigarettes for him at the club. Turns out that he complained that the quality was not bad. I said, give me back the cigarettes. The quality's not bad. And he says, I could sell them. So instead of selling them, we just gave him like, I think it was two grand, put it on the envelope. I got a nice card, welcome home, you know, just to mess with him. And I put the money in and I gave it to the old man. And he was so honored by that, that I gave him. And that lit up his eyes because now he realizes I'm a guy who gives money, you know, and that's what they want. I know how to play by the rules. And in that world, you got to know how to play by the rules. You got to be a money earner. You got to also be an individual who may be able of doing prison time and capable of violence. He liked my big size, so this big guy, you know, and the fact that I took cigarettes that he knew he couldn't sell, but I sold them. And in essence, I gave him the money. I did the right thing. So I marketed myself. You know, I became that shiny object for him because it's all about money. So whatever fear or not meeting anybody else that he didn't want to meet, he wanted to meet and get to know me. We switched the cat and mouse. So I became the mouse. He became the cat. So he's interested in finding more about you, who you are and what you're about. But who does he think you are? Well, I got introduced to him through a source. So he thought I was this guy from Miami, Florida. I was a third generation Sicilian who grew up in Miami. And I was kind of a guy who was dope dealer. I was a guy from uh, Florida dealing in dope, dealing in swag. And then I met the source up here in New York, and I was going to go into business with the source in the strip club business. We were going to open up other clubs as well. So I kind of, and again, this is where sources come into play. It's always good to have multiple sources, you know, vouch for you as somebody who you are, especially in the mob world. We got an issue here, though, because Mm -hmm. you're not Italian. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, that was the part, that was the most amazing part, because when they approached me early on, I said, guys, I can't pass for an Italian. What are you, crazy? So he says, I like rice and beans, fried bananas. I'm Cuban. No, oh, made in Havana. What are you talking about? He says, no, no, listen, I think you could do it. Nat Parisi, who is one of the case agents, says, look, I'm Italian. I'm first generation Italian. I know you could do it. I'll teach you what you got to say, what your cover should be. He trained me on what to do. So I became an Italian guy raced around Cubans. But I was Italian. I was Sicilian root. And besides the great identification the Bureau gave me, I took it another step further. I went out there and I found a Mr. and Mrs. Falcone who is buried at a a cemetery in the event I was down in Miami with these guys, and they wanted to see, hey, you know, innocently, you know, Jack, I know you're from down here. Well, you know, how about your parents? I know they passed away. Why don't you show respect? Let's go get some flowers. You know, what what do you do then, Jerry? I Mm. found the Mr. and Mrs. Jack Falcone. Oh, my, really? (laughs) So I know they're buried in the same place as Jackie Gleason is in Davie, Florida. And I could take them to that site. And the only thing I would hope that their family would not be there at the same time and say, who are you? You know, so (laughs) but I took that because here's the thing. Unlike every other cases that I ever worked, if I'm working a dope case, a dirty cop case, I don't have to tell you anything about me. Okay, I don't have to tell you my history. I don't have to have any accountability. But when you work the mob. You better have accountability. Okay. They need to know every single thing about you, where you were. And that's where the bureau was excellent. I went the extra step of finding the Mr. and Mrs. that I had informants that I utilized in Florida ready to back me up who are dope dealers and stuff that would back me up as being, Hey, this guy is Italian. You know, I also went the extra steps as you were going through this of trying to learn the process of what it was like. They bought it. They never, I thought to myself, they weren't going to buy it and they bought it. They never, they said, Hey, he's a CG. He's one of us. How you doing? Jackie boy, that's good. No one questioned it. See, these guys don't speak Italian. People think they're sitting around talking. No, they speak American. 
So I fit right in. Nobody questioned it. I was in shock. So were the case agents. But hey, you know what? (laughs) I guess money does a lot of things to a lot of people, you know? But one of the things that they also did as we were in a few months is they wanted me to join a union. And again, the great work by the case agents that they set it all up for me. And what it really was after I filled out the form, the old man said to me, look, Jackie boy, so we're going to get you in the union, which they did. I got in the union. Actually, I got dental, eyeglasses, retirement, medical care, better than the FBI, I may add, okay? Better than Samba, okay? Oh, that's so, a shame. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sitting there and I go, oh my God, can you believe this? So anyway, we sat down with the president of the union and we joined this union. But the old man came back. He says, I gave you that form not only to get you in the union, but also I had you checked out. Now, what does that mean? Look, these guys have a lot of dirty cops, law enforcement types, PIs, whatever you want to call them. But obviously I was checked out and I passed because I'm here to tell the story. So they actually had somebody run a background check on you. That's what he said. Ran a background on me. Right. Because I guess in the form you're listing down Social Security, DOB, last address, all that kind of information that (laughs) you would have to put uh, when you're applying for a job. Well, that's the difference. I guess you mentioned about Joe and today's undercover. Back then, they didn't have the Internet. Okay, back then that was never done. Now that it's done, you know, bad guys learn from their mistakes. So now it's becoming tougher. And I guess the next person that goes with what I'm going to do, it's going to become even tougher for them. So it's one of, it's all, life is all about timing, Jerry, as you know. I, I just was so happy that it was the right time. I had the right case guys to work this case to make it happen for me and do it. Joe probably would say the same thing. It was all about timing. In today's world, there is so much accountability in the mob. There's also so much distrust. And just like in the movie Goodfellas, when the little kid walks in dressed up in a suit, he goes, as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Well, that's what some of these kids in 18th Avenue and Brooklyn and some of the other places, they they may want to aspire to be. And that's where they see them growing up in these neighborhoods. Now, it's a little separated but that distrust factor is there. I mean, I could tell you stories as I was going through my undercover with this guy that actually was proposing me to get straightened out. He told me that the Bonanno crime family now strip searched guys before the ceremony. Now, what kind of family is that? Wow. And what kind of trust is that, that you got to strip search somebody to see if they're wearing a wire? I mean, this is the how much the FBI over the years has really influenced these guys and the hurt that they have done to this organization, that they are now stripping guys to get straightened out. So, you know, they learn from what we do. Their cases go to trial. They learn. They find out ways to not repeat these problems. The Colombians were the same way. When we worked dope, they would always somehow suspiciously come up with some kind of attorney, wanted to know, trying to figure out who was the informant. Who is the guy who told us? Who walked the guy in? How did this happen? So they don't repeat it. So criminals are now learning in organizations of how they're being infiltrated and how to prevent it from doing it. Countermeasures. Yes. All right. So we're going to have to do like the Reader's Digest version of this case because I've got some other things I wanted to, to ask you about. I've been a terrible host, and I haven't mentioned your book yet. We just said it in passing, but you wrote a wonderful book called Making Jack Falcone, An Undercover FBI Agent Takes Down a Mafia Family. The great thing about the book is that I know you had somebody helping you with the writing, but you are a great storyteller. And this book is, the book is written the way that you talk. It is just, it captures you in and you want to know what's going to happen next. And, you know, there's twists and turns. And so I want to make sure that people who feel that we've kind of shortchanged them on a deep dive into this part of your undercover role, I want to make sure that they know that this book is here and, you know, provides all the details. But can you tell us how far you went with this undercover role with being 
Greg De Palma's driver and, uh, you know, how it all worked out at the end for you and, and for him. Well, just to backtrack a little, Jerry, regarding the book, you know, I didn't write the book, of course, I had a writer. And the reason why I sound like I'm talking to you, I would record my conversations and then the writer send me what uh, he wrote about the thing. So I, I never been really a good writer. So I was fortunate at least to have a guy he would just write down. So it kind of sounds like me talking because that's the way he wrote. It seemed like he just put it on uh, on typing. And also one of the things that I want to say, if I have the opportunities that some of the names were excluded from this book, not by my doing. Sometimes the pre-publication review, as you know, Jerry, they felt that the guy either was working an undercover operation, was working other sensitive matters, or they didn't simply want to be in the book. So whatever that that was, and you know, on that. But now getting back to your question, as far as what happened with Greg De Palma, the beauty of this case was that we were able to identify made members of the Gambino crime family that were never on any of the charts. Okay. And that's important. That means these guys were flying below the radar, but they were still bookmakers, loan sharks, and they had their own little extortion rackets that they were operating. We also were able to identify the hierarchy of the organization as to who is the acting boss in Arnold Scutieri, the underboss in Tony Megali, the, uh, the concierge in Giorgio Carra. So we were able to connect those dots. We also were able to identify some of the extortion business and companies that they were on record with, these Gambinos and Greg De Palma was on record with, so we could find out the scope of the organization. Now, my job, of course, I was, I was kind of blessed because, you know, the hard work is really behind the scenes, the work of, of Nat Parisi, Reddy and, and Munger. These guys went up on wires and did all of that you know, work that's required in that. And of course, we had a Cracker Jack AUSAs working this investigation. Now, I'm also during my book, as you know, towards the end, I I do have issues with the way this was terminated. I looked at it as being short-sighted in as much as all the cases I've ever worked, and I've done over 100 group ones and group twos investigations, and God knows how many by bus. But during that time, we always work going up the ladder. And I felt we had a unique opportunity here since I was proposed to be made. And they were going to get me straightened out that if we would have gone through it, we could have introduced some of these great undercovers that we have in the Bureau to tack some of those other families and maybe nationwide to go after Cosa Nostra. You know, I think that could have been the thing And yet it was decided to be terminated for whatever reason. And there are so many out there floating. But at the end, my life was never or my identity was never in a situation that would have been compromised. But our decisions that are being made, they're above our pay scales and we simply move on. This is, I, I guess, Joe, I think, had the same issue. He felt that they could have still continued. These are cases that have a beginning time and an ending time. But one of the things that I felt, we did gather a lot of great intelligence. And I think we could have used some of these other UCs that we would have had to maybe go into and shake the trees up. Because every so often you read about the great work of the FBI, they locked up 70 guys, 50 guys, 40 guys. And then, you know, they're back to work this next day, the gangsters. You know, for everyone you lock up, somebody gets promoted. It's all about with money with these guys, and it's all about that they're replaced because, you know, they got to keep that machinery of making money and bookmaking, loan sharks, sports betting, whatever you want to call it, it, it. It's still being used by these guys. And as long as people bet, do some kind of lo- do loan sharking or even buy things that fall off the back of a truck. You know, you're going to have the mob. I mean, they're here to stay. And the unfortunate thing is that the, the FBI is, you know, has not listed them as one of their investigative priorities. And I understand that, that of course it's terrorism. There is cyber. There is corruption of all kinds. And I get that. But these guys, they're still out there and they're growing in numbers. And yes, they've learned from all the cases that we've done and they're crawled back under the rock because keep in mind, La Cosa Nostra is strictly a criminal, a secret criminal society. 
So because they're secret, they work in the shadows. So by us maybe not having all the manpower that's required to attack these guys, they may be growing and maybe in a few years you may see their return. But I do understand that there are other priorities, just like in narcotics. We used to have narcotic squads all over the same way now. We have to refocus and target the most influenced one. I just wish maybe we had more manpower in the FBI so we can allocate them to working these cases like narcotics and working uh, organized crime in order to eradicate them. When you talk about organized crime, I know that more so now than you know prior years, you know, there are there's so many organized crime groups of Russian organized crime and Asian organized crime. Do you have any idea where the mob, you know, fits in all of that? The, you know, Italian organized crime, where do, are they operating at the same level of, you know, producing and making money and, and, and doing illegal activity? You know, they're still out there. You know, it's kind of like a, like a wounded animal, you know, although weakened, they're still, you know, very dangerous, you know. Yes, they are more careful now. They don't go out there and do blatant extortions like they used to do in the old day. If you notice, they don't leave bodies on the street that much because they know that that's bad for business. So they have changed. And also you get to see how many informants are out there who right now are competitors of yours in the podcast world. I mean, you got Sammy the Bull, you got Michael Francesi, Johnny Adlai, Larry Russo. You have the list goes on and on. These are guys who are living in plain sight. And in the old days, the mob would have made sure that they weren't around. But that's because the mob has morphed. And then they try to change the whole meaning of, uh, you know, Cosa Nostra and this and that. You're a rat, you know, simply as that. And in the old days, a rat would not be around. But the mob still are out there. They're operating. They're just being a little more careful. They're not going knocking on the door and threatening to beat up a, a union foreman. They're sneaking in the back door and slowly massaging it. Yes. And like I said, as long as you have bookmaking, which generates a lot of money and loan shark that, by the way, in this climate that we're living in, this pandemic climate, these guys are rocking and rolling with money loans. So there is always business. People, they're still robbing trucks. They're selling them. They fall out the back of a truck. They still have their hands on, you know, in the garment district and this kind of district, the fish market. So they're out there, but they're not making as huge amount of monies as they were back in the 70s, 60s, and 80s. We have kind of beat them somewhat, but they're still out there. And I think by us not focusing full resources on them like we did in the past, they're going to start growing back again. Well, and one of the, I had been listening to some other podcasts that you did, you know, in, in preparation for us talking. And one of the things that you said that I wrote down was that mobsters shouldn't be making headlines. They should be making money. And that is, that exactly tells it all. They're in the business of making money, not headlines. So you're right. I mean, the last thing they want to see is their name up. And, you know, that's the same thing with me is people say, to you, aren't you afraid? I said, well, first of all, the mob is not going to come after a law enforcement officer. I think if they did, they know that would be a huge mistake. I mean, the reign of terror would fall upon them, okay, for going after a law enforcement officer whatsoever. In fact, they're not even going after informants and rats. Now, are they going to come after us? Okay, that's number one. They don't do that. And also the fact, yes, I had a minor contract supposedly out of me. I don't buy any of that because the way the mob works is if I'm the boss and I want to whack Jerry Williams, I simply go tell my Luca Brazzi, take care of Jerry. And it's done. It's not, Luca Brazzi doesn't say, well, how much are you going to pay me? Is that, you know, 300000 am I getting for this? It, it doesn't work that way. It's more like, hey, you're ordered and it's discreet. You don't want to have people know in your business that you're going to whack somebody. And you certainly, you know, whacking somebody is the ultimate thing. You know, yes, the people get whacked. They show a symbolism, a, a sign. He's left out in the street. But look at the, the horror stories that happened with the DEA agent that was killed by this guy, Farazi, you know, in, in New York. We went all over New York and shook every family 
up and down as to close their money, their gambling casinos. We hit them all, brought them inside. They don't need that aggravation. They have enough issues just trying to go out there and make some money that they don't want to have that as a recourse. Now, is there a guy out there capable of maybe saying, hey, I knew this guy. I'm at a restaurant. I know where here he is right now. And maybe go out there and try to give me a beating. Hey, you know what? That's life too. That could happen with the Colombians. That could happen to you, Jerry. You could have one of the Ponzi scheme guys that you've investigated in your life come after you. You know, it's, you know, that's why I never traveled out my two friends, you know, Smith and Wesson. I'm always bringing them. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Okay. So we're at the point of the show where I ask when you joined the FBI and why you joined the FBI. In the mid 70s, I was a senior in college and we went out to see a movie. That movie was uh, Serpico with Al Pacino. And I was like, wow, this is what I want to be. Here's this cool guy, Al Pacino, with a beard, right? He lives in the village. He has a beautiful girlfriend. He has a motorcycle and he's long hair and he's an NYPD officer. I said, wow, this is what I want to be. I want to go into law enforcement. And that was my wake up moment. And this is the field that I wanted to pursue. So what happened was immediately afterwards, I went and applied for the FBI and filled out the preliminary, I guess, application. But I didn't hear from the FBI. So moved on to the next level where I figured I wanted to get into law enforcement. I went back home to New York, where I was from in the Bronx filled out all kinds of employment applications, NYPD, Newark uh, Police Department, New Jersey State Police, everybody I could possibly find that I wanted to get into law enforcement because that's what I felt that was my calling. That's what I wanted to do. But unfortunately, that was a bad time in the mid, uh, late 70s. There were police officers being laid off. There was no money. And my whole fate as to what I was going to do, I couldn't land a job. I said to myself, this is kind of a, you know, a weird predicament that I'm in. And then I'm watching Univision, which is the Spanish network. And I see these non-native Spanish speaking FBI agents literally butchering the Spanish language. And he's saying how they're looking for FBI agents to come and apply. And I said, wow, this is unbelievable. I have an application in there and you guys are looking for them. Look no more. Here I am. Next morning, I call up and I speak to the applicant recruiter in Newark. And I said, let me get back to you. Gets back to me that same day and says to me, look, the reason why your application went nowhere is you're not an American citizen. So I said, well, what do I got to do? He says, you got to become a citizen. So I immediately started that whole process. And then I was naturalized in 1976. And then I called the FBI and said, let's get this thing moving. And then the process started. Now, during the interim, I got a job in the Union County Prosecutor's Office as one of their investigators. So I had a job finally in law enforcement, but I wanted to work for the greatest law enforcement agency in the world, the FBI. And then finally, in 1980, they asked me and I got appointed into the bureau. It was an interesting ride at first, but I got into the bureau. And when you go down to Quantico, you know, you change. I no longer want it to be that long hair, undercover type Al Pacino from Serpico. Now I want to be Ephraim Symbolist Jr. I mean, I, I wore the suits. I wore the three-piece suit. I wore the wingtip shoes that we used to call the Thousand Eyes. I got put in a bank robbery squad and a terrorist squad. And I was like a sponge. I soaked up everything from all these great agents that were working on that squad. I do want to talk a little bit about what you're doing now, because at the very beginning, I said that you were one of the nicest guys that I know. Now, there obviously is another side of you <laughs> that other people have gotten to, <laughs> to experience, but you are one of the nicest guys that I know. And what you're doing now is proof of that. And if anybody wants to look at you know, what you post on LinkedIn, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But tell us about what you're doing now. Well, I'm working with the Guardians of Rescue, which is an animal rescue group. And, you know, someone has to be the voice to defend our little four-legged friends. I've seen too much abuse, uh, neglect, and horror 
of people out there treating all types of our animals and and it just pains me you know and a good friend of mine is the president of the guardians of rescue and we go out there and but one of the reasons why I guess my LinkedIn is so large is because the many volunteers that are out there with Guardians of Rescue that do see abuse or neglect, you know, they contact us and then we try to feed it into the local police department to take that complaint and move them from the bottom all the way to the top. We're trying to go out there and change the mindset of people as far as the animals. We're there to help if people need homes for the pets or if people need medical care. I mean, the show, they had a TV show last year on the animal planet called The Guardians. And I recommend people to watch that. I, I didn't go on the show because I was tied up with some other things, but I'm a big believer of The Guardians and anybody wants to donate, feel free to do so. It's strictly volunteer work for me. And like I said, is uh, I guess I'm I'm still chasing the bad guys, but those who beat on are our little four-legged friends. And I recommend also go out there instead of buying a dog, go rescue one. You know, they'll tell you how much they really love you every day. I have two pound puppies, and I know exactly what you mean. You know, when you're on social media, I love it when your stuff comes up and, you know, I get to look at puppies. <laughs> Isn't that a great thing, right? Yeah, it is. I, it, it kind of makes everything worthwhile. We're living in a crazy world. Thank God for puppies. That's all I got to say. I like that. All right. So I always give my guest the last word. So what would you like to say? I made it. A lot of people might have not believed that I've left for 26 years of service in the FBI. Looking back, it was one hell of a ride. And that's the end of the interview at jerrywilliams.com. You'll find several photos of Jack Garcia. There are lots of links to newspaper articles and stories about his undercover career and the cases he worked, including a transcript of his interview on 60 Minutes. There is also a link to where you can purchase his book, Making Jack Falcone, An Undercover FBI Agent Takes Down a Mafia Family. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books, and your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI in books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, fun for armchair detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series, features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler in Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.